This is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the innerverse. I'm your host, Chance. And as of this recording, it is a sunny Saturday on the 20th of July, 2019. I don't know about you, but I'm a bit thunderstruck by the buck wild full moon in Capricorn we just surfed through. And it's a Mercury retrograde season to boot. But dear listeners, we're not going to let that slow us down. Indeed, it has been a doozy of a month for many of us. And whether your time has been magical or maniacal, I'd have to think that by now we're all taking more notice than ever before of the wisdom that's stored in the starry vault above. Today, we're going to pry open those doors of perception a few degrees farther with a grand unifying theory that connects the above and below in movement and in flow. It's called astro yoga, and it's not exactly a new idea, but for our Western society, it's been forgotten for far too long. Past astrologers on our show have all agreed that the real mystery of the heavens is encoded in your body as much as it is by the stars. And so it only makes sense that we next begin to look at movement as the magic medicine for transmuting malefic planets, stagnant mentalities, and problematic personalities. Luckily, we have an expert with us to examine these ideas and more with an emphasis on the functional elements of folklore from wisdom traditions around the world. She's divining the doings of the devas and prescribing the most potent poses for the people, and her name is Emily Ridout. Emily is a yoga teacher with over a decade's experience who has fused her advanced education in folklore into a fully developed system of specialized divination that will leave you with much more than just a memorable conversation. She actually synchronizes the yogic movements and practices she recommends with the individual's birth chart to develop a system that's tailored to their intentions and accounts for each client's unique strengths and weaknesses. The path to divinity is within and... Gracious educators like Emily can show you the gateway to your Godhead, which is found at the intersection between body and mind. I was so excited for this talk today that I took the advice of a free chart of yogic movements for each sun sign that you can get by signing up to Emily's email list on her website at emilyridout.com. And based on the fact that I'm an Aries, I did as the chart suggested and tried a headstand, succeeding at it for pretty much the first time in my life, which was not only physically invigorating, but pretty mentally exciting as well, which makes a lot of sense because Aries represents the head and doing a headstand circulates a ton of energy to the brain. So before we begin today, I'd like you all to stop what you're doing and get in a headstand and hold it for the entire conversation if you don't mind. (laughs) Of course, I'm kidding, but it is a great time right now to at least remember your basic breath awareness and take the few seconds required to ground yourself with some extra conscious oxygen intake. As we get ready to dive into this chat with Emily, check the show notes for links to learning more about Astro Yoga with Emily at her website. Follow her on Instagram. And of course, don't forget that you can support Interverse on Patreon to get extra shows and a growing archive of extended episodes. 
Now I think it's more than time to do this thing. I couldn't be more grateful. The stars have aligned to bring Emily to our online tribe for her first deep dive on the interverse. So please join me by sending out an energetic blessing blast of welcoming love through the nearest quantum astral wormhole or just get online and show her some love with a nice comment on social media. I've got more than enough questions and probably not enough time to get to them all. So I guess let's get to it. She's the loving lore master of life's astrological lessons and the yogini who can teach you to be your own personal genie. Emily Riddout, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Interverse. Wow, thank you for having me. That was an impressive introduction. You should be like a musical hype man or something in your spare time. Dude, I'm definitely a hype man. I mean, it's a different system, but in ideology, I'm a seven. So that's like the enthusiast. That's why I do what I do. This kind of came naturally to me. Before I even learned about divination, all it did was confirm when I learned about it that I was doing the right stuff. So tell us about who you are and how you got to be this particular character in life. Well, um, as you noted, my name is Emily and I have two degrees in folklore, which is the study of creative pursuits, wellness pursuits, traditional knowledge in everyday life that has either existed in the past or the present. And I lived my whole life with this incredible fascination with the esoteric astrology, um, definitely yoga. I spent, yoga was my gateway drug. And then about 10 years ago, I was living in India and I stumbled upon my first deep dive into astrology. And at the time, I didn't even know if I believed in astrology. I thought, interesting. I'd love to learn about it, but I wasn't sure how it worked. I didn't quite understand the connection between your body, between the timing of the universe, the timing of the planets and the timing of our lives on earth, including the natural cycles of the world. Um, and so I was dumbfounded because I kept learning more and more. And I would go to my friends with their charts and say, it says here that according to astrology, you are experiencing um, some weakness in your ankles, but you don't appear to be to me externally. So I'm just curious. And they, they would be like, how did you know that? I've been struggling with this for years. And so that kept happening. And it sent me on this 10 year long deep dive into the relationship between astrology, your body and your yoga practice. And so often um, astrology is already associated with yoga. If you practice any type of really traditional yoga, even, even our Ashtanga friends don't practice on full moons or new moons, which is one form of astro yoga. Um, but then if you also look deep within history, all along the European trade route, the Indo-European trade route, um, India, the Middle East, even Europe, people have been exercising astrological knowledge in their medical practices and in their wellness practices for a long, long time. And just when we started in our sort of science obsession of the 1920s to the 1950s to say, oh, I don't believe in that, um, to use the term folklore as, oh, it's not true. Um, we began to lose some of that cultural knowledge. And so one of my goals is to highlight that even though some cult, some folklore might be um, not true, quote unquote, like it's a story or it's made up, um, a lot of things that we study in folklore are in fact incredibly true and have a lot of value in our lives. And by accessing that, we can create a richness in our practices and our lives and in our overall well-being that's so valuable. Folklore was one of my favorite subjects in school. When I went to college, I did take several folklore classes. And then really anything literary, as far as education goes, it's a form of folklore in a sense, because you're reading someone's opinion on their own time period, whether fictional or not. What I find most interesting is that part about how folkloric stories and myth isn't literally true necessarily. Like maybe the story of how Coyote became Wiley isn't something that you can go back in history and be like, it happened to this coyote. And now they're all like that. Of course, 
but it does tell you something about the interplay between archetypes in the world, which astrology has a lot to do with as well. So I think it's really cool that you've spent so much time studying folklore. I'm curious if that's the case, you probably are aware that there's multiple systems of astrology to choose from. And I'm wondering which one is your preferred one, or do you sometimes shift systems depending on the situation? Absolutely. So I really appreciate each system of astrology I've come across. And most astrologers do agree that when you're reading astrology, you should read within one system at a time because the systems did develop independent, not independent of one another, but sort of in little bubbles where even though there's some shared terminology, there's some differences in how you would read it or interpret it in a certain system or another system that are both um, totally correct, um, but that don't necessarily need to be completely matched together. And so because of that, I tend to read Western tropical astrology um, because I teach in a Western context, because I was born in a Western context, I live in a Western context, and this is really the co cultural context of this astrological system. However, I love my friends who read Jyotish. I love my friends who are Hellenistic astrologers, um, and I see a lot of value in those systems as well. Actually, those are two systems I'm not even familiar with, but I would guess Hellenistic would mean referring to the maybe Greek pantheon and Greek philosophy. I'm more familiar with sidereal lately because I found that pretty interesting. And also I'm aware of Vedic astrology, which comes from the Hindu tradition. But what is some, what are some interesting elements of Hellenistic astrology that you're aware of? That's kind of a, a new one for me. Sure. So the Hellenistic astrologers are, it's more close to Western astrology, but they, um, they only recognize the planets that are visible to the naked eye. So Uranus, Neptune, Pluto are not included in what they do. And I believe a lot of Hellenistic astrologers have some degree of knowledge of horary astrology, which is um, a way of planning out the exact timing of events um, that was used in that cultural context. Um, the Jyotish one that you mentioned is actually the same as Vedic astrology. It's another word for the same thing. It means the science of light. I like that idea of horary astrology because it seems like, I mean, I, I'm personally a big conspiracy research nut and there's something either mystical happening that the universe lines things up or people in positions of occulted power somehow line up world events to do this on purpose and get more energy out of them. But you can always find an astrological correlation to big things that go down in the world that everybody hears about to what's happening in the stars right then. And it's kind of like a chicken or an egg question, uh, I would say, which one influences the other. Maybe it's just a mere reflection of one another. What do you think? Well, the why is a fascinating question, right? Is it People sometimes say, well, is it the gravity of the planets among each other? I really believe that the universe um, moves in cycles and patterns of time. So when we look up at the stars um, and the planets, what we're really looking at is this complicated divine clock, right? That's moving with this sort of sacred geometric pattern um, that we see up there. But then when you look down at the cellular level on of your body on the atomic level of what's going on in matter, you see it reflected in shape and in pattern and in timing. And so astrology um, is really looking at the timing of your life, the good things, the ugly things, the pretty things, um, and then those challenges that sort of pressure cook you into growing and expanding. Yes, you can look at it as frequency. It's one of those new age words that kind of loses its meaning in its overuse. But what frequency literally means is how frequently does this measurable thing occur? So I heard you talking about Saturn cycles, for example, happening in years of seven as it squares and conjuncts moving around in its 28 to 30 year cycle. So what are some of the ways that we can take into account the frequency of 
certain seasonal things or planetary movements in our movement practices. Could you give an example of, uh, you know, details about how you're mapping astrology to a yogic practice for the general population for a certain day or for an individual based on their chart? I'm curious about some real world examples of that. Absolutely. So I can get really deeply into detail and I do for my classes and my students, but the number one first way that you might approach astro yoga is to simply choose the sun or the moon and to look at the patterns of those. They're called the luminaries in astrology and they are these great influences and they're the easiest to track. So um, a great example is the sun in the summer, right when cancer season starts is the solstice. And then right when Capricorn season starts in the winter is the winter solstice. Libra and Aries seasons are the two equinoxes. Um, and so people, um, a lot of yoga practitioners already, without knowing that this is astro yoga, practice 108 sun salutes on the solstices and begin to practice equilibrium balances on the equinoxes. So that's just the, the simplest way to start. For my clients, so I actually took a look at your chart. You emailed me your birth time, and I took a peek right before this, and I noticed you just had a Saturn return. So in that case, not all of your yoga students or clients or whoever are going to be having a Saturn return at the same time. So you wouldn't necessarily teach a public class about a Saturn return unless if you knew everybody in there <laughs> happened to be the exact same age and we're all going through it. But as far as Saturn returns goes, Saturn actually rules the bones of the body, the actual structural system. Saturn is the Lord of time. Um, and Saturn in particular rules the knees. So a lot of the times when people are going through Saturn returns, it can feel that's one of the transits that can feel a bit pressure cookie because if you, if you're on track and you're doing everything right and you've never made a mistake in your life, Saturn will probably still come along and say, Hey, did you know that you only live for a hundred years? Hey, did you know that you have a particular life purpose that you need to be living out and you need to start doing it? And then it's like, now, now now for like 12 months. And so people who are experiencing Saturn returns often need two things. They need deep rest so that they have the energy to do what they're going to do. And they need strength and not strength that comes from just the muscles of the body or external forms of strength, like um, having a lot of money or having a lot of resources some people think makes you strong, but literally the foundational bone structures of the body, doing things to support that will also help people as they move forward in the direction of their, truly their ultimate life purpose. I like being used as an example there because I can reflect on the last couple of years, 28 to 30, and how the pressure that has, was on me was like really around making this show and expressing what I'm here to express in the world. And so it got to the point where I would feel like I was almost overburdening myself with the need to do that and taking other things out of whack by that. One thing that helped me really restore the balance was working with the colon and cleansing and detoxing because that root is associated with Saturn as well. And that's also where a big part of our strength comes from internally. If we can have serious discipline on what's going on to our gut, then that can reflect out to discipline everywhere else. And Saturn being the disciplinarian, I think that part of your energy system likes to be recognized and coordinated with. And whenever you lack all forms of discipline, you do wind up with gut problems, health problems, digestive problems. It's the whole nine. So, uh, Really, even before one gets to their Saturn return, they can work with the Saturnian energy and the internal power generator purification center that's in the Dantian, the lower abdomen. There are what what are some good yogic movements for uh, tuning up your Saturn? <laughs> so the first thing you need to do is 
in order to focus on strengthening what you have is to release those things that you don't have or that you don't need, I should say. So usually the first thing is a breath work purge essentially. So things to wake up the low chakras. If you ever do the type of breath where you do a forced in and exhale, like, or the one that seems like you're panting because you're just bouncing your wall in and out, that's going to affect a lot of the earth, the earth signs. So a lot of Virgo stuff is down there. Um, as you noted, some Capricorn stuff, and it's going to start churning out things that live in your lower chakras. So, um, and to be clear, like the reason a lot of people at their first Saturn return haven't achieved their life purpose is simply because they're young. They had to, um, go through their first entire cycle of Saturn moving through their chart. Um, and that entails everything that's happened since birth, right? You didn't come out of the womb talking on a radio show, with the level of knowledge you have, right? You had to go through those first 28 years and like learn to walk and talk and, um, you know, grow into an adult sized person and experience all the things that you did. And sometimes those things are good. And sometimes those things are bad, but whatever they are, they live in your low chakras. So when, as you, as you do that breath work to bounce it out, um, it can be very helpful. Some, some people, um, find it's distressing because some people have stored a deep level of trauma in there. Um, what I'll say about that is if you do feel distressed, um, do it until you feel the first level of distressed, then pause. And the distress, it's not like what you're doing is actually traumatizing yourself. That's the trauma releasing. So it's like, the smoke from the fire that it might feel like a bit of a panic is coming on. Yeah, it definitely can. But yeah, that's definitely, that's a sign that you're moving something because what it means is probably that at one point you did feel a panic and you just shoved it down and shoved it down deep inside and said, I'll deal with this later or never at all. So it, our energy is what stagnates us is when those feelings go unexpressed or unfelt. Would you agree? I would definitely agree with that. Um, I, as a yoga teacher, am obsessed with this idea of whole body consciousness, right? The idea that your brain stores its intelligence, right? The reasoning, thinking mind. Um, your gut stores its intelligence and your heart its intelligence. And then um, sometimes our intelligence systems can get warped by fear or um other things that have caused us to recoil into ourselves. And unless if we're able to release that through our bodies, um, we'll keep reacting to it subconsciously and drawing more situations like that into our lives to say like, Hey, deal with this. I'm still here in your second chakra or wherever. I am wondering of what you can say about your own chart and how you've informed your own perspective on life for yourself. Are there any good examples of a time when you were able to using astrological analysis, help yourself make a better decision or make a change that you were, were resisting? Absolutely. So I have a very recent example. <laughs> um, I actually right now um, am experiencing an interesting transit of Pluto and Saturn in my seventh house. Um, and just to give some background, your seventh house is your house of relationship. Pluto is the planet of deep transformation. In mythology, Pluto is like Hades, the god of death. Um, of course, in like Greek and Roman mythology, the god of death is actually more like a dark mothering figure who helps you move through transition, right? A recycler. Yeah. It's not our Western idea of the devil. This is like the shepherd who helps you figure out this, this next journey of change. And so, um, a lot of people think like, Oh, Pluto, scary planet. And sometimes Pluto does show up and say, time to face your biggest fear, <laughs> have fun. Um, and then Saturn also as the God of time, these are usually called 
two of the most challenging planets to navigate, um, comes around and says, hey, do you have boundaries? And if you don't have boundaries, I'll, I'll show you what the boundaries should be. <laughs> so, um, so navigating that, um, it's all going through Capricorn, which Saturn is naturally at home in Capricorn. And so I'm actually experiencing a shift in, in location because of a relationship. So, um, that's the external, the external Saturn thing. Um, could be viewed as another person coming through your life. And my partner is actually an ascendant in Capricorn. And since Saturn rules Capricorn, um, you can sort of see him there. But then as well, um, there's this motion of Pluto through there and I'm actually changing location. And there was an end to um, a position I was doing here that was just with the outer planets, just totally outside my control. Um, the U S government passed a law. I was working at a Confucius Institute. The Institute closed because of a law they passed about China. (laughs) Wow. That's very external. That's like nothing you can control at all. It's true. And that's how Pluto transits work. It's not like you can sit in your meditation chamber and avoid, um, the transformation that's coming. And it's also not like you can sit in meditation and spark the transformation yourself. A Plutonian transformation comes from elsewhere. Well, that's a really good point to bring up that there are times where you can see a transit coming or feel a certain type of energy in the lineup. You could say whether you're looking at the stars or not. And in some instances, you could possibly through ritual or physical practices bring that energy into your experience in a way of your choosing rather than it just kind of coming and happening. However, would you agree that you can kind of deflect or redirect certain changes to your favor that way? I think you can. I don't think you can deflect it. Like if, if your purpose is to like, I don't want the pain of a Plutonian transformation. I'll just do this transformative. Good luck with that. (laughs) Instead, then it's like, yeah, well, that's just you avoiding it. But if you're like, okay, change is coming. I'm here and I'm ready to work with it in a conscious way. Then I think that can be very helpful in having a positive experience with something. So if you can kind of get a grasp on what the right change is using intuition, divination, combination of those things, and then you make that change consciously then maybe you won't have to have it forced upon you. That's kind of, I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's not so much that like you're changing the threads of your fate, but you're surfing the wave. Right. And all you can control is yourself, right? There's no denying that in life, sometimes we're handed surprises that are truly devastating. You know, the death of someone, um, some violence that we encounter or are a part of, you know, you can't, you can't just be like, I've made my bubble and it's safe, right? Because inevitably other things will get in. But as far as you having the most positive growth oriented experience you can in whatever challenging circumstance or in whatever good circumstance, um, you can definitely work with your chart to achieve that. So you brought on the concept of Saturn being the Lord of boundaries, right? The limiter, but not necessarily in a negative way. It might seem negative to be limited. The reason I bring this up is because one of the most powerful experiences it, during my Saturn return was earlier this year, where rather spontaneously I entered into a heightened or elevated, maybe Kundalini like experience of consciousness. And in that experience, I basically got what I wanted, which was this Jupiterian idea of removing all limiters, removing all boundaries and barriers and full expansion. And while I was in this state, I was wildly disoriented because without things being in their place, it's hard to describe it, but just like all the insides were on the outside, I was experiencing the reality in a very psychedelic way for hours. And it was spontaneous and intense, but in the end of it, why, why I bring this up as being so remarkable is I gained a respect for Saturn or the limiter, which I had seen very largely through a negative lens, almost, um, you know, c- you can connect Saturnian uh, occultism with Satanism in many ways, because in an inverted form, that's actually what it represents. 
So it was really cool for me to have this experience and get to the point where I'm asking for the barriers to be put back. Please put everything back where it goes. <laughs> and respecting why that's there so that we can navigate our life experience in a way that's comprehensible. And all this is just leading me to the real question I have for you, which might be maybe too big to put into words, but I'd like to have you try. Why do you think that we migrate from infinite consciousness into individuated personal life stories that are seemingly separate, although, although not? That is a great question. Um, and what I think, since you asked, is we are all an aspect of infinite consciousness that's manifested to experience itself. And of course, in yoga, we have something called the tattvas, um, which are the layers of reality. Everything from like the elements, like earth, right? Dirt. All the way up to the great cosmic consciousness, the haridaya, the heart of everything that contains the great God and goddess Shiva and Shakti. Um, so in yoga, everything is Shiva or Shakti or yin and yang or however you want to phrase it, this divine play of inert matter and then the spirit that animates it. And so this great cosmic consciousness, like when you're like, oh, it's just one thing, you have to think, well, if you were alone in a room forever, what would you do, <laughs> right? And you might start, making up stories, you might start being like, oh, I've made these little figurines and they're doing things and we're animating them. But a big purpose of, or a big concept in yoga is in this structure of reality, there are layers. And of course, astrology exists on one layer and you and I exist on one layer. Um, and then in one place, there's something that are the cloaks of reality. And these are the things that make us think, um, those wounds everybody has where they're like, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. But really the the positive aspect of that is like, we think we're not whole because we're a limited aspect of consciousness. And if we remembered that we were all of consciousness, that we have a connection to that, and we stayed in that state, we wouldn't be able to function on the plane we live on. Exactly. I mean, I wouldn't say that I was all the way to full cosmic realization, but just moving up that ladder into a different layer does get disorienting for a bit. Like I had to get you, it took me a while to get used to it. And, you know, a lot of people have those experiences on psychedelics and it takes years to even integrate what type of information came through. And I do think at this point in my life, I'm much more interested in the ways that we can dip our toes in those deeper waters of full and total self-realization in a way that doesn't leave us drowning. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, what I want to leave people to take away from this conversation might be, if you're, if you're willing, if you could give the audience something to take home with them, like uh, a quick rundown of some of the sun sign connections to certain movements, possibly. Because I mentioned the Aries and the headstand. If you want, I could even send you your own chart because I found it really helpful. <laughs> it totally, it totally is a helpful chart. I agree. So if you think about the zodiac from Aries all the way down to Pisces, um, we are connected through the body. And so it sort of goes straight down the body. Like the head is Aries, the feet are Pisces, and everything else moves all the way down. Taurus is the neck. Cancer is the giving heart, the nurturing heart. Um, Leo is the receiving heart. Um, Virgo, intestines, belly, that stuff. Um, Libra, back, low back, I should say. Um, Sagittarius, hips, thighs. Oh, sorry, Scorpio, sexual organs. You can't forget Scorpios. Um, knees, bones, Capricorn. Ankles, circulatory system. Um, Aquarius, and then I already mentioned Pisces. So you can, you can think yourself, um, and notice yourself. If you say, if you know that you are a sun sign in Taurus and you know that the back of your neck tends to be tight 
you might try a plow pose. If you know the front of your neck tends to be tight and your heart feels a little closed off, you might try the fish pose. Um, and so just going into deep inquiry within your own body saying, what's my sun sign? If you know it, what's your moon sign? What's your ascendant? And what are some things I can do to both activate this body part, you know, strengthen it, make it do a little work and um, begin to cool it down. Um, and that'll be different for different parts. The spine obviously can twist, it can back bend, it can forward fold, it can side bend. Um, so if you have, if you're one of the ones in the torso, um, the sexual organs can be um, lit up in many ways, not to forget our Scorpio friends, but they can be grounded more toward the earth or they can begin to activate by doing some motion with the pelvis. And so um, that, of course, they're the sexual organs. So I know everyone will go straight to um, the pop culture definition of Tantra and, you know, you can, you can have all sorts of meaningful or non-meaningful sex on your own time, but you also don't have to um, sort of wake them up in that way. You can wake up the inner workings of your chakras in there to really get that going. And so that's truly the secret of, Scorp of the Scorpio thing is the Mula Bandha, the root area, the root chakra, Mula Bandha, um, or sorry, the Muladhara the chakra. Muladara. That's the only one where I actually know the word for it. So it's not like I was ready with any of them. Got lucky. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the Mula, it's the Muladhara chakra. And it, then it's the Mula Bunda. And Mula just means rock and Bunda means lock. So when you, when you do the motion in yoga, like you're lifting your pelvic floor and ceasing the flow of urine, um, that's, that's that capacity of Scorpio to hold the deep emotion. And um, if you've ever been a Scorpio person and you felt like your emotions were not contained, sometimes doing that bunda will help. Um, and if you feel like your emotions are too contained, sometimes releasing that bunda will help. I found that a really good piece of advice for someone that just wants to feel that root area and even sacral area is the diaphragmatic breath of expanding the lower belly with the inhale and then pushing the air out by sucking in, but also pinching and trying to close the pelvic floor as if you're trying to stop yourself from peeing. And that can really stimulate that area. And another thing that I like to do that I learned through a Qigong teacher is very small standing circles with the pelvis where imagine that there's like a string that's tied to your belt buckle, even if you're not wearing a belt and it's held above you and just very, very lightly being pulled and uh, just going in very small circles with the pelvis and essentially like trying to move just the energy that you feel whenever you're sensing that area rather than trying to move the physical body. And in a little bit, you'll find like a little bit of practice. You'll find that it feels like something else is moving you. Like you're literally being pulled rather than like you're forcing the movement. And I think that's a good entry level way to feel a type of internal energy flow. That's not quite so centered and controlled just by the head. And uh, that's one that has really helped me with, with those areas personally. That's a really beautiful practice. And it goes into that thought of the deep water because Scorpio is the deep water sign um, and water being something that flows on its own once it's set into motion um, and us being, you know, mostly water um, doing that practice sounds, that sounds wonderful. So. Yeah. You can combine it with other body parts too. You can do small circles with your feet, small circles with your hips. Like I just described, you can do it with your head can raise a hand in the air and do it that way. And I find that whenever you're seeking to just do these very subtle movements, sometimes it can have the most profound feeling to it. As, as I understand it, you're actually practicing moving the energetic body, which is like you described, one of those layers of reality. Your physical body has an energetic body that's inhabiting it in a sense that's almost like 
almost like a second body that's just on a subtler, less dense level. And you can, <laughs> I feel like when I'm doing those practices a lot, I can kind of push that energetic body slightly out of line with the physical body and like come out of it a little bit and snap back in. I don't know how, to, I don't know how else to describe it. When you do these practices while looking in a mirror and let your gaze kind of defocalize a little bit, you'll start to even potentially perceive the aura of that energy body moving around, swirling around your physical form as you, as you stare at it. So it's to me, it's something I've had a lot of fun exploring and experimenting with in my life. And I hope others can take this opportunity if it's not something they've looked into to really realize that the movement practices of all of the folkloric traditions have a lot of merit, regardless of which one you're studying. It's a matter of learning and getting in tune with your own body and self through a symbol system that you can study and come to understand. And it's like teaching your mind and body a language for communicating with one another. Absolutely. Like the reason to follow one system is just so you can have a coherent structure of study, but all these systems, like one system might call it one thing, one system might call it another thing, but they're all trying to point us, I think, toward the same ultimate truth, which, you know, what good is a spiritual system if there's not like truth involved, right? Yeah. What good is it? anything without truth as its core, which for me is like beauty. If it's an experience that's creating and generating beauty in your life or opening you up to perceive the beauty in life, that's where the magic is. That's where the life force is. And one thing I wanted to ask you was if you know of any poses that are particularly good for opening up the imagination or stimulating creativity. Absolutely. So um, it depends... I suppose on the type of creativity you want to do, but usually Pisces is the great artist of the Zodiac. They're the ones who look at boundaries and say, Hmm, we don't need those. We can start to expand and enter this state of a dreamlike reality. And so there's a lot of meaning in Piscean style art and also a lot of deep beauty. Um, and so Pisces, um, one you of are best, one, aren't you? May I ask? Are I'm not Pisces. I'm a Capricorn sun. Oh, okay. I misinterpreted the sign symbol that's on your website. <laughs> oh, um, the cancer sign is on my website. That's my ascendant. Oh, okay, cool. Sorry to interrupt there. No, it's okay. I put it there because cancer is the sign of nurturing and caring. And I really care about the people I work with. So I thought that would be an appropriate symbol. But yeah, as far as a Pisces stimulating the the creative the creativity, I would start by trying to do a toe, a toe, either a toe balance or a toe stretch, which is simply where you sit on your heels and your toes are tucked under. And if you've not done this, it can create in most bodies a strong, sometimes unpleasant sensation. Um, so you don't have to hold it for long, but once you feel the energy surging up from your feet, then I would begin to move the body like water. So anytime there's a spark in the body, you can begin to do slow, subtle movements. And this is in part yoga. It's also in part in the art form continuum, which is a healing practice that came out of modern dance. Um, but you just start to slowly move the body spontaneously from what's exiting your feet. And in doing that, your body will begin to experience its own flow. Um, and hopefully whatever was living in your feet, those latent impressions that your feet, which are sensitive little beings, um, noticed will start to rise up through the spine toward your head. So I would try that. That's really interesting to me in particular, because I actually already do that pose of sitting on the heels with the toes tucked under a lot, like daily. I, I mentioned that I was Aries sun sign in the intro, which is true, but I'm also cusped with Pisces, like right on there. And in sidereal astrology, like five of my planets are in Pisces. So Depending yeah. on how you look at it, I'm as Pisces as I am Aries. And 
which is interesting because that's the head and the feet. It's like the farthest signs away from each other to be cusped with. But or if another way of looking at it, the beginning and the end connect and it's a circular thing. But I didn't ever incorporate some sort of flowing, watery, Tai Chi like movement after sitting in that pose. And that sounds like a really good way to draw that energy up because I know what you're talking about, how you start to feel like this tingling, almost bursting with energy whenever you focus on stretching or put a lot of weight on a certain part of the body. It can just build up and build up. And I've never actually made an attempt to move that energy like you describe. And I'm going to give it a shot because it's something I was already doing half of that. And that's cool to hear. I love it. Oh, cool. Well, let me know how that goes for you. (laughs) Absolutely. Maybe by the time I'm recording an outro to this conversation later, I'll be able to report on trying that out. (laughs) But really awesome. Uh, uh, Before we finish the first hour, I wanted to ask you, maybe if you could describe how you personalize a set of practices for individuals that you deal with as uh, clients. Sure. So I look at their chart, which it if you can read astrology, this might make sense. If you if you aren't as familiar, it might feel a little um, strange at first. But there are angles among planets, and there are configurations. So when an astrologer reads your chart, they're not just reading like your sun is here, your moon is here, your Jupiter's here. Like you get if you've ever gotten one of those free things, and there's a paragraph on each. Um, they're look they're looking entirely at the systematic configuration of you. And so I look at the angles among planets. I look at areas of the life that the, of their life that the person has perhaps self-reported that they'd really like to work on. And then I look at areas where there are important transits happening. And then, and then the person and I work together to talk about what their level of yoga is, what their level of movement practice is, to find postures and positions that are appropriate to where they are in their life and their yoga practice that also will um, soothe the places that need soothing, wake up the places that need a little oomph, and invigorate um, areas of, of tension so that they can release and move through the chart more easily because most people have places that are easeful in their chart. And then a lot of people have places of significant um, tension that could be harnessed as like energy, like fusion or fission creates a big lot of energy, right? Um, Or could be just places of deep frustration if there's stagnant energy there. You mentioned the connection between the neck and the Taurus earlier. And it was making me think about my mom, who is a Taurus, who has had, I mean, not severe, but throughout her life, she's had various problems with a lot of stiffness and soreness in the neck, even an accident and a car, a car accident many years ago that sort of onset a lot of that. And then thyroid problems, the front of the neck is sort, sort of interesting how that parallels to the sign and I'm going to tell her about this episode and maybe she'll check it out. <laughs> get her doing yoga because I've been trying to get her into yoga studios for for years. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of us think like we're born and we are our sun sign perfectly, which is just um, a, mis- a, mis- a big cultural mistake. We're actually here to learn a lot about becoming more like our sun sign. So even though you were born under the sign of Aries and the sun, you might be more like a Pisces, but how do you take all that Pisces energy and turn it into a person who's a true um, leader in, in philosophy, which I'm just glancing at your chart. Yours is in your ninth house. So you're actually, you seem like you're right on track. (laughs) So good for you. But, um, but a lot of us can wake up our sun signs by just beginning to work with that area of the body. Yeah, it was majorly stimulating to just do a headstand. And it's something I always felt like, nah, I can't do that. Nah, I can't do that. And lately, I had been giving it more tries than ever before. And today was the first time with no spotter, I was actually doing it. So (laughs) it's pretty cool. I feel more Aries than ever after that. Oh, Do you have any takes on medical astrology you'd like to share? Because this is sort of a related field. Sure. So... 
disclaimer, I think if you need medical help, real swift medical help, um, you should always go to a doctor, right? Always go to a doctor. But as far as um, creating health and wellness, um, I think we've used our medical system way, way too much for that. We're like, oh, just take these pills and you'll be healthy. And it's like, well, we should probably address the whole person um, and hopefully in a way that prevents illness, right? So people have been researching it for a long time. We know that by incorporating healthful foods in your diet, um, by getting a certain amount of movement in your daily activity, um, you're more likely to sustain well-being longer. Um, and there's more and more studies being done on your mental state and even in your awareness of your body. So, um, I've been learning more and more about the research on how much of your awareness rests, not in your head, but in your physical body, um, and how that relates to how often people get sick. And it's, it's remarkable from what I've been learning and I've experienced it in my own life. So I'm like, oh yeah, the more I'm aware, um, the less sick I become. And I think, um, what I'm doing with astro yoga, um, what other people are doing with astro yoga and what medicinal astrologers, astrologers do are really, um, tied to each other. So, um, some, some medicinal astrologers take it to another level where they're assigning herbs, things like that. Um, and that's, if you look at, um, like Jyotish astrology, that's what the Ayurvedic doctors are doing is they're looking at the whole person. Sometimes they involve an astrologer and then they're offering them cures, right? Which are, um, herbs that they eat or certain ways of eating, certain ways of being sometimes even mudras and mantras, taking it back to the yoga. And so for me, it's all of a piece. It's just attacking it at a slightly different angle. And it's holistic too. this type of an approach. It hasn't actually hit the airwaves yet. I haven't published it, but the next episode I'm about to put out of the show is with a guy named Keith Gladys, who spent almost a decade working with a Taoist herbal master and using Qigong practices, taking a lot of herbs to actually heal himself from a very debilitating case of Lyme disease. And what is most interesting about both this conversation and that is to me the, the take home point, which is the better holistic shape and awareness you have of your body. Total self-realization is what I would call it. The closer you can get to total self-realization, literally being aware and realizing everything that's going on with you on every level as much as possible. That is what prevents pretty much every type of malady you could get. Like it's even the cure for cancer. We've all seen it a thousand times. Someone that's diagnosed with cancer going into extreme rebalancing mode and a holistic, harmonious approach to healing their body. And it goes away. It's pretty consistently clear and relying too heavily on the fix it button or the fix it pill definitely doesn't do us any favors for self realization or awareness. So it's cool to be getting constant confirmation and reflection on that. And I, intend to maintain a high level of health my whole life because I found out about this before I started getting really sick. So wish me luck. <laughs> I wish you luck. And of course, sometimes people just get sick too, right? Like, Oh yeah, those Pluto <laughs> things that you can't avoid. <laughs> yeah. And so if, if you're a person who does have a deep disease, like, you know, don't beat yourself up about it. Don't be like, oh, was my consciousness not in my body enough? Sometimes you've come and you're experiencing that um, not because you're flawed, but just because that is the experience you're having, right? And so we can't we can't be like 100% medicinal astrology will always protect you from everything, right? Because Pluto comes along and Saturn comes along, and there are these things that just show up, and you're like, like yesterday I saw a mountain lion. It was huge. It was terrifying, <laughs> and I had no idea that it would just show up, right? And um, luckily, I I walked away from the mountain lion just fine. But, um, you know, things come and they're surprises. But that's also part of the fun. Wouldn't want to know everything. Otherwise, I mean, astrology would really be too much of a cheat code if you could just figure out everything from decoding it and have 
no surprises left. What would the point be? You'd just be right back to being that solitary, infinite consciousness locked in a room with yourself, which is, it's good to know that that's what you are ultimately, but it's fun to play. It's fun to surprise yourself, create the game of life, right? Absolutely. You came here to be you, right? So just, just giving that up and going back to the infinite abyss is um, not, not necessarily the best way to be yourself. <laughs> yeah. I like to think that why we even have this web of connectivity between individuated perspectives is like, we're creating like a map of the abyss. We're literally mapping out the infinite abyss in a sense, like we're bridging between one point, which is our origin as um, mortal beings to the next point, which is the return to the immortal originless part of self. I think a lot of what comes down to amounts to problems in our society and in our individual lives is actually deeply connected to the fact that we're on the higher level without an origin. You know, to an extent, we all could feel that we're abandoned by our parents because there aren't any cosmic parents to the original God and goddess. They, they just are. And that's when that realization, that's when you can actually start to be sort of your own parent because otherwise you don't have any. You, you can treat your own mind and body like that child that you're caring for unconditionally and making healthy choices for instead of treating life like it's a ride you're stuck on and it's just going to take you where it takes you. I think I see what you're saying. So we all contain all of the archetypical personalities within us, right? We have the old wise person, um, the wild person, the, the parent, the mother, the father, right? We have all these things inside of us. And of course you might have a mother and a father or a wise counsel person who's external to you, but you can wake up all those beings inside yourself. You can be in touch with your inner child and know how to play, right? You can be in touch with your inner mother and know how to make sure that you're getting eight hours of sleep. <laughs> That's really or, important. It is because if you can't take care of yourself, it's very difficult to show up in the world. Well, we've got a decent chunk of time left, but I wanted to give you plenty of space to describe in whatever full detail you'd like to give us your services, the variety of services, how you'd like people to connect with you and uh, what it's like uh, to be your client. You know, I'd love to hear maybe even some success stories or whatever you feel called to share. Sure. So um, what is it like to be my client? Um, I think my clients come because they want to understand more about astrology and they want to deepen their yoga practice. And often I just read an astrological chart for a person who maybe isn't as interested in the yoga aspect of it. And there are things you can do that aren't yoga that will wake up aspects of your chart. Um, or sometimes people will come for like a full astro yoga session, um, which is not so much me talking like I would in a, in a yoga class, like leading you through a flow as it is a conversation about the sorts of things that would be helpful to you. And so your astro practice, um, usually out of those is not so much like a studio flow where someone's like, rise your arms up, bend over, you know, do all the things, um, as a simple step-by-step -step process that you can do from the comfort of your home after after our session and experiment with and try and then contact me. So um, I think my clients find that I'm very available to talk to them um, when people have questions, especially if they've done an astro yoga session. I know astrology sessions, everyone has a thousand questions afterwards and I'll answer some of them or you can come back for a second reading. Um, but with, with astro yoga, because it is so... So personal, um, it's not uncommon for some of my clients to call me afterwards and say, oh, you know, I experienced this when I was doing this posture and I was curious about that. And sometimes I say, oh, well, that's a really intense emotion. And maybe we should add this extra thing that you can do. Or um, sometimes we'll tweak it a little bit. Or sometimes they'll call me and say, oh, my gosh, it's working great. And I you know, was feeling a little stuck 
in this area or that area, but I've actually seen a lot of growth. Um, so that's what it's like to, from, from my perspective, at least for my clients. And I think people come because I'm easy to talk to and I, I can break it down in a way that's, that's palatable for people. And I can also go really deep and detailed if you have a lot of knowledge about it already. So, so yeah, so my offers that I have on my website right now, first things first, I offer something very, very free, which is every week I send out a weekly astro yoga forecast with a pose that you might consider doing that week according to what was going on in the stars. And then I write a little couple paragraphs just about what is happening in the stars and things I'd like to highlight. And there's step-by-step instructions and some tips on how to do the yoga pose. Um, So if you're listening to this, please sign up for that. It is free. It's every Tuesday. I send it out. Um, And I'm also doing a couple free other things. I think by the time this publishes, it might already be done, but I'll probably do it again as I'm, I do week long video series um, that are also free that just, you just have to sign up for. And it's just tips on how to navigate your energy body, short, less than five minute practices to do, to connect from the comfort of your own home. From there, I do paid services. I do tarot readings, astrology readings, um, synastry readings, which are two people's astrology charts combined to look at compatibility. Um, I do many astrology readings um, for less money that are just short, focused on one thing like um, your sun, moon rising, or sometimes people want to focus on their Venus or their Mars or some combination there. Um, and I also do astro yoga sessions, which I think is what I'm most well known for. Um, and that's just simply looking at the chart and figuring out postures, practices you can do that will aliven and awaken it. Sounds like a lot of stuff that you do for people. Honestly, uh, you've devoted a big chunk of your life to it clearly. And There's many ways to make money in the world that are probably even easier. So we thank you for your service and being yourself and providing this multi-leveled, multi-layered version of self-analysis and movement mastery. It's extremely cool. Uh, I guess we're about to pull this train into the station. So Emily, please... Give us your closing thoughts on this talk. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a very great learning experience and a lot of fun to connect with you as I've been anticipating for months. I was planning this a long time ago. Um, also, don't forget to remind people how they can connect with you online and how you'd like to be found. Absolutely. Well, Chance, thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, this was such a pleasurable conversation for me. And my closing thoughts for your audience are just that whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your level of astrology knowledge or yoga knowledge or any of it, um, just take a moment, connect deeply within yourself, deeply within your body and experience the truth and the wholeness of who and what you are, which is whole, complete and completely lovely. Um, of course, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, sign up for my free email newsletter, my weekly Astro Yoga Forecast. Um, and I also do readings online, or if you happen to be local to me, I can do them in person. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Where is local for you? Just because we never did mention that. Well, right now I live in Eugene, Oregon, where I've lived for seven years. Um, but I am taking a hiatus and going to Alaska for a while. Oh, yeah. You did mention you're heading to Alaska. Wow. Well, best of luck out there. I'm sure that you'll find a lot of intriguing things to inform us about as you explore that different part of the Earth map. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm going to live on the island of bears, the Kodiak Island. Very cool. Definitely a good time to maybe become a photographer or something. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I, like I said, I had a huge amount of fun having this conversation. I'm sure the audience loved it. 
Guys, make sure that you're following Emily on Instagram, emilyridout.com. I could not recommend highly enough to get on the free astrology forecast uh, email list because it's free and it's not trying to sell you anything. It's trying to tell you something. (laughs) So even more advantageous. And yeah, thanks for being here. It's been a pleasure and we'll talk to you soon, I hope. Thank you so much. is beautiful friends another episode complete and i'm especially happy to say that a personal struggle of mine has also just wrapped up i spent a good couple of hours before i even got around to recording an outro for this episode just trying to identify and destroy a background humming buzzing sound that was coming through my microphone and so i wanted to bring that up because essentially I had to just persevere. (laughs) I was really confused, could not figure it out, couldn't find the right tutorial, tried and tried, and this buzz wouldn't go away. And eventually, the answer ended up being something simple that came to me that wasn't in a tutorial, but I had to go digging through all these things just to get there. And I want you guys to keep in mind that I'm not a professional audio engineer. I have no training in a classroom of any kind, on anything I'm doing right here at all, (laughs) any level of it. And that means that just like me, you can pick up something and figure it out for yourself using your logic and reason. You actually have the free will to learn whatever you need to learn. You have to just make the choice that this is going to get figured out, even if you have to leave and come back to it or whatever, or you are going to make that thing in your own way. But It might not come through someone else's answers, just like I couldn't quite get other people's tutorials on how to get rid of this background hum to work for me. So that all being said, I think we can also apply that concept to yoga, astrology, these divination arts and movement medicines that are so intricately linked and correlated together, which I find to be amazing and really useful. I want to talk more about that in a second. But we can use this perseverant determination of will to actually bring about super and helpful, positive, healthy changes in our life just by deciding we're going to do it and then getting in there in the trenches and making it happen. I often get awestruck whenever I attempt to teach myself something new that the process is actually so doable. But it requires that you have patience and you focus and maybe you need to meditate to develop the level of focus to sit through some boring tutorial about how to use some kind of, I don't know, program to create digital art with. And I am by no means the master of this. The reason why I get so awestruck whenever it actually does happen for me that I teach myself something new is that I'm like, why don't I do this at least once a day? Every day I should I feel I should dedicate like 15 minutes to learning a new trick or a new skill or something to add to a skill I already have. Just figure something out. Like it could be basic. It could be mechanical. It could be like I'm going to figure out how to put up a different trim in this room or I'm going to figure out how to change the flooring in my house. Or I'm going to ch- figure out how to provide meals to some homeless people. I don't know. I mean – There's something out there that you would like to be doing that the only gateway is that you haven't taught yourself what you need to know yet. So don't let astrology or yoga especially ever seem like an insurmountable thing. Just start looking at it a little bit at a time, doing it a little bit at a time. 
If you don't feel like you have time to do a 60 minute yoga class or you can't afford to get out to the studio and pay someone to teach you, go find YouTube videos that will give you whatever amount of time you feel you can spend. I'm sure there's 10 minute yoga flows and 60 minute yoga flows. But in particular, I think you'd be really interested to be checking out Emily's email at uh, email, what do you call it, <laughs> newsletter list. She posts some pretty cool stuff, astrology updates, and also you can get a free chart of yoga moves that correlate to stimulating and soothing the different astrological signs, which are also different parts of your body. So you can actually apply those to any situation. It doesn't necessarily mean you got to use the Aries one if you're in Aries, but that if your head's a little cloudy, maybe some of the Aries postures would help you with that. Or, you know, the stomach issues being related to, what did she say they were related to? I don't know, hearts related to Leo, right? <laughs> I remember that. So I need to study this more too. I mean, look at me. Uh, I'm fascinated by it. And I think that in my general sphere of jack of all trades knowledge that I do have, it's come from just being curious and taking in one bite at a time. How do you eat an elephant? Just like that. One bite at a time. And <laughs> I guess it also kind of ties into the other thing I wanted to get back to talking about real quick was why it's so good to be multidisciplinary. Why Emily is so impressive to me that she's not just a folklorist or a yoga teacher or an astrologer. She combines all those things and probably other things into the total package of what she's bringing to the table. And that's really what it means to access your uniqueness. It's not like some mystical thing that, you know, you're waiting on a messenger raven to come and give you a scroll and be like, ah, you're meant to be a painter. No, I mean, maybe painting is something that you do, but you could easily incorporate your love of mythology into that, into what it is you're depicting or whatever. I'm just trying to give those as examples, but in truth, anything, any couple of things or multiple things can be combined to be your personal perspective on the creative process and what you're bringing to the world. I think it's really cool. Also, the fact that the more different fields you know something about, the more you can actually easily understand the other, you know, the new things that you encounter. So another way to look at it is that the more facts that you take in, the more easily you can recall things and connect dots. One of the problems with modern education and science in general, and even like the corporate world of having a job where you're kind of kept in your lane and doing the same thing every day is that, well, besides the fact of what we just talked about, that it's really great to learn something new as many days as you can and not just have a repeat day. Uh, the other thing is that that compartmentalization of the knowledge definitely keeps you from seeing the bigger picture wherever you are looking. So that's been a big problem, I think, for science until modern years where the Internet's made it easier to access research and people can do some cross-pollinating between disciplines. But I don't know why we ever thought it was a good idea that someone should be just a biologist or just a physicist or just any one thing and pigeonhole yourself like that and identify as just a thing or as a, a certain type of doer, I should say. When in truth, you, your infinite total potential is is where you are. You're the pure potential of the cosmos crystallized into, yeah, there's some things about that crystallization that may seem like limitations or whatever, but on another way of looking at it, that's just the materials you're choosing to work with for this art project that is your life. So, wow. I guess I want to remind everyone also about Plus. <laughs> I just kind of went on my rant, but you might not have heard the second hour of this conversation if you're not a subscriber to Interverse. And I sure love it if you'd become one. Not only would you please me by being able to tune in to the second part of all of our chats, which tend to get a lot more high vibrational, if you will, metaphysical, um, all around more interesting after you've warmed up with a person for an hour. So in the first uh, hour, we talked about all kinds of things related to the cycles of nature and the body and, you know, whole body intelligence. And even a lot about the yin and yang and such. But in plus, we had a great continuation on the folklore topic and the wisdom in Hindu traditions. We discussed food for thought regarding our thoughts on food, the deep connections between astrology and tarot, one of my favorite topics in astrology, the lunar nodes and balancing between our karma and dharma. Pretty deep stuff right there. 
We talked about our thoughts on the upcoming Aquarian age and also mitigating malefic planets and Mercury retrogrades. And boy, did we just come through a doozy of one. <laughs> and also we spoke on Venus energy and bringing the divine feminine into full bloom in our personal lives and the world. Of course, a lot more than that as well, but I can only take so many notes. I'm not going to like document the whole conversation. And what's the point of you getting in there and getting the surprise of the things we're discussing? So yeah, $5 is how you get it. $5 a month on Patreon. Working on a different solution besides Patreon, but it requires money. So I kind of need you to use Patreon for now. And the more of you that use it, the sooner we will start expanding into a much more connected community through you know, some sort of a platform that I can build you online using the funds from you beautiful, generous subscribers. So don't be a freeloader. <laughs> I would do this work for free, but I want to do more of it. And so I also think that there's a real amazing connection that's formed whenever we make our currents uh, link up, if you will. So I'm putting my current out to you in the form of the energy of this show. You, I'm connecting your current to some pretty interesting people that maybe you didn't know. So perhaps it's time for you to go and get on Patreon and put some current back towards us, complete that beautiful circle of life. You won't regret it. If you do, though, tell me why you did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, you don't have to. You can just quit anytime. Even if you want to get on for just a month and check out some of the archives and dip, still better than not listening to those podcasts, awesome extensions, right? Another thing I want to remind everyone, other than to definitely connect with Emily on social media, also you can connect, I guess, with me on social media through Interverse Podcast, anywhere that you want to look it up. On top of that, I want you to definitely go listen to Lucid, who I've played on the show def more than once, I think, has to be three or four times by now, but he's a awesome live looping solo multi multidisciplinarian, <laughs> multiple instrument wielding madman, to be honest, in a good way. Uh, he just put on a video of the song that I'm about to play in the outro <laughs> called Rents Do, which, man, I'm really feeling the crunch right now, not to complain about money, but the song resonated with me big time. I don't think I've heard him sing in quite this cool, awesome way that he's doing here. So you'll hear the song played in the outro. I recommend going and checking out the video for it because it's one of those cool practically one shot uh, live videos of the performance where it's not like they put the song over a video. It's like you're seeing him really do it, the wizard at work. And it would be cool if you supported this amazing master musician by following him on SoundCloud. But yeah, if you are new to Interverse, you can subscribe basically anywhere that podcasts are served. Uh, YouTube is also an option. I do BitChute. I'm on a couple alternative social media sites like Steemit and Minds. And then Eureka.org is the most important one to mention. I have an intention to keep mentioning it regularly because it's my favorite of the alternative social media sites out there. Also, he, it's created by friend of the show, You're a Soul. And it's completely designed and dedicated to being a heart opening space and a channel for compassionate communication as well as true and uncensored information, freedom of speech, and freedom of consciousness in all elements. So check out Eureka.org. Go send me a friend request there. I think you'll like the features once you get the hang of it. It's got a lot of them. It's quite robust. So yeah, find all the links to things I just mentioned in the show note, including patreon.com forward slash interverse. Thanks for sticking with me for another episode, or thanks for joining me for your first time if you're new. Really happy for all you friends of Emily's that have come along to check out this episode with her. And I'm sure that it was a thrill to hear her express herself so authentically. And I definitely got a lot out of it. Shout out to Emily Steinmetz for connecting us for this episode as well. Great promoter, manager, person there. So yeah, thank you everyone. We're ready to set this ship a sail. Got an awesome episode coming up next week. Really interesting multidisciplinary stuff. Once again, more on the scientific side, though, rather than the, I guess you'd call it pseudoscience, but I don't really consider it pseudoscience when we're talking about astrology. But on Wikipedia, it's called pseudoscience. Next time we're getting into more hard science, and I think it will be quite a refreshing burst of informative entertainment. So stay subscribed. 
I don't know why you would unsubscribe. Stay subscribed. <laughs> uh, send us a five-star review on iTunes if you use the podcast app. Share the show with your friends if you're feeling kind. Click the bell if you use YouTube so that you'll get notified of new episodes as they release. And most importantly, keep learning new stuff. Don't ever feel limited by any element of your situation. And just realize your determination to grow and your decision to use your will and your reason and your mind at large to teach yourself whatever is necessary to go forward. Don't forget you can do that anytime, all the time. And I think the more you do it, the more quickly you will climb the life mountain up to the lofty views of higher expanded consciousness and the fractal epiphanies that await there. Yeah, fractal epiphany. That's kind of a good description of the episode. I'm going to make that the title. Also, it's the title of the Lucid song that I played between the, uh, the whatchamacallit, interview and the outro. And wow, that's a lot of rambling. Amazing that I can just talk so long without a break or a breath, hardly. Because before I get further the mic, I'm like, what am I going to say? I'm like dreading it for some reason. But yeah, there's plenty to say. Overactive throat chakra for sure. Love you guys. Catch you next week.